But let's open up with a word of prayer. Mm, Father, we thank you. Thank you for this time together, for this session, and for what you have in store. We just go ahead and say yes to it. Whatever it is, that's what we want. Because we know that your plans are good. We love you. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to move among us. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 This afternoon, I am looking for just one. I'm just looking for one. If one person gets this last message, it could change the world. Now, would I love to have all 24 of you? Yes, of course. But I'm looking for one. That's how valuable this message right here is. Because if you get this message, you will be unstoppable. And all the other messages up to this point have led to this. The power, the light, even the chocolates. <coughs> okay, not really the chocolates. But everything has led to this moment. So if you've got your Bible, I want you to turn with me to 2 Kings. We're going to talk about a miracle, a big miracle. When you come to the end of yourself, that's where God then can really begin. 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4. When you come to the end of you, that's where you end. And faith begins. And that is a super powerful place to be. Now, I don't know if you've noticed or not, but my life is kind of a life outside the box. Why is it like that? It's because I realized that the more I am outside of the box and the more I come to the end of myself, guess who I get to see more of? God. And that's a really fun place to be. And so what I found is that as I get to the end of myself, he shows up, he does something awesome, well then I get really excited to do something else where he has to show up. So I put myself in uncomfortable situations on a regular basis, things that I know I can't do, things I know I don't have the finances to do, things I know that are outside of my realm of capability. Why? Because that's when the miracles show up. That's so fun. Do I look like a miserable person to you? No. Do I look like someone who has abundant life to you? Yes. Yes. And that's the secret. So here we go. 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4, starting in verse 1. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that he revered the Lord but now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha replied to her, How can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a little oil. Elisha said, Go around and ask all your neighbors for empty vessels. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour into all the vessels, and as each is filled up, put it to one side. She left him and afterwards shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the vessels to her, and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, Bring me another one. But he replied, there is not another vessel left. Then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. Ooh, how many of you have ever heard this story before? It's not a very common one, actually. It's not preached on very often. And I had a man by the name of Jensen Franklin teach me out of this story right here. And it was so impactful in my life and ministry, I committed to teaching it to others. 
So let's read it one more time. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he revered the Lord, but now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha replied to her, How can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a little oil. Elisha said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty vessels. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your son. Pour the oil into all the vessels, and as each is filled, put it off to one side. She left him and afterwards shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought all the vessels to her, and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, Bring me another one. But he replied, There is not a vessel left. Then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your son can live on what is Pretty cool miracle, yeah? I think it's one of the coolest miracles in the Old Testament. And here we have a God, I need a miracle moment. Would you agree? I mean, at this point, this widow's future is riding on this one miracle. Let me give you a little bit of cultural background here. If there was debt in a household and then the husband died, by law, those who were owed the money could come and take the next generation, meaning those sons, and put them to work to pay off the debt. Now, if that would have happened, what would have happened to the widow? Support. No support. She would have been literally with nothing. So this is a God, I need a miracle moment. Now, I want to make a parallel here that I truly believe that right now, our next generation is getting ready to be enslaved. We as a culture in America are in a God, I need a miracle moment. Because Satan wants to come and enslave the next generation, you guys. He wants to enslave you and keep you in bondage because he doesn't want the miracles to happen. And so he's trying to do all he can to enslave you in that. And you see in this story that the miracle is dependent upon something. What is the miracle dependent upon? Available vessels. vessels. The miracle is dependent upon available vessels. Newsflash for you. There is not a lack of miracles. Heaven is not the problem. God is not the problem. Blessings are not the problem. The problem is God needs available vessels to pour them out to. You determine the magnitude of your miracle. You determine the magnitude of your miracle. And this woman right here is a great example for us because at first she says to the prophet, she said, I don't have anything. Oh, except, what does she say? Except I have a jar of oil. And she was willing to give it all. She was willing to give it all in order to receive the miracle. You determine the magnitude of your miracles. If you're going to give God just a little Sunday morning, 11 to 12 pint-sized portion of your life, guess what you're going to get in return? A pint-sized portion of a miracle. But if you're willing to say, God, I'm giving it all to you. I surrender it all. I give you all this oil that I have. I give you all of me, God. Guess what's going to happen? You're going to get a massive amount of miracles. 
you get to decide. She was willing to give it all. And so she said, I've got this oil, and what does he tell her to do? Go there with me. Verse 3. Elisha said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty vessels. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour the oil into all the vessels, and as each is filled up, put it off to one side. She left him and afterwards shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the vessels to her, and she kept pouring. When all the vessels were full, she said to her son, Bring me another one. But he replied, There's not another vessel left. Then the oil stopped. Elisha, who is a prophet, gives her a piece of advice I'm getting ready to give to you. He said, go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Not everyone is going to understand your calling. Not everyone is going to agree with the miracles that are taking place in your life as you are here at this school. The advice Elisha gives is very wise. Go and shut the door. Because the people out there, they're not going to get it. There are going to be people in your lives, even people in the church, who are not going to get it. But at this point, this is where the miracle begins to birth. Go and shut the door. I like to tell people that your calling is your calling. It wasn't a conference call. Your calling is yours. Don't expect people to get it. Because most likely they won't. People do not understand my calling. A single white female going into the middle of the jungle of the Amazon of Brazil to plant churches among unreached people groups. Days away from a major city. Days away from actual communication with the outside world. People were not on board with that, guys. But had I let them determine the magnitude of my miracle... We wouldn't have five worship centers, 11 wells, and thousands of Bibles and different church plants among unreached people groups in two different countries right now. You determine the magnitude of your miracle, and a lot of times that means it is going to be isolating. That's okay. Find one, find two who can maybe agree with you. Even if that one or two is me, I will believe with you for the crazy. I will go as you shut the door, and I will go in there with you. And see, it didn't take a lot of faith for the woman to pour the oil into the first jar, did it? No. I mean, she had a jar of oil, and now she's going to pour that jar of oil into a second jar, into a second vessel. And so what do we think is going to happen? Obviously, the vessel is going to get... The oil, sure, no problem. We're going to pour one to one. No problem. That's easy. But then she had to have a little more faith. Because now she's going to have to pour it into another vessel. And then into another vessel. And at this point, this is exciting, right? Because now she's starting to see the miracle. And that's why people don't understand it now, why I'm so happy all the time, because they've never gotten to experience the miracles like I have because they've only poured the one time. And when God calls you to do something and you see a miracle, guess what? The next time he calls you to do something, it's not going to be less than what he called you to do the first time. It's going to be more. And it's going to require more faith every time. 
But the more she pours, the more she gets excited, right? And she's pouring, and she's pouring, and she's like, it's working! And all of a sudden, she's so excited, and she looks at her sons, and she says, go get me more vessels! Because now, she's on a roll. She's seeing the miracles. Go get me more! And what does he say? There aren't any more. Then, the oil stopped. The oil will stop when there are no more available vessels. Again, God's not the problem. Heaven's not the problem. A lack of miracles is not the problem. The anointing's not the problem. There's plenty, but God's looking for available vessels to pour them into. And that's why he's looking for you. But how much do you want? You get to determine that. How much oil do you want in your life and in your ministry? He's got new anointings. He has new dreams and new visions. He has new blessings. He has things we've never even thought of before. Innovative ideas, songs, poems, ministries. But he's looking for available vessels to pour them into. That's the key. It was my life's goal to plant one church among one unreached people group. Now, that could have taken me a lifetime. Wouldn't you agree? For sure, right? Could have taken a lifetime. And it made sense in the Christian realm, right, as a Christian and as, a mission, as a, a one who wanted to go into the ministry, it made sense to pour my life into one vessel, one church plant in my lifetime. But as we talked about before in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 through 21, when we do that and we begin to ask and imagine, what does God do? Immeasurably more. more. That's when you get to experience the miracles. But you still have to have the faith to go after it. You have to have the faith to do it. Sure, you can do just one and then stop. Or like the woman, you can keep pouring. So let's say um, you've been here on Kauai for a while now, right? And you guys have probably noticed it's a little bit different than the mainland. If you go to a store, and let's say you go to the grocery store, and you buy your eggs, and you buy your milk. Oh, you guys are, uh, you know, 19, 20, 21. You buy your cookies, you buy your chips, you buy, you know, you're buying your ice cream, yeah, Snickers bars, there you go, your candy bars, your chocolate. You're buying all this stuff. You're getting it all. Your soda pop, I'm sure you got some orange juice in there, because that's really healthy for you. You're getting all this stuff, and then you go up to the counter, and the lady checks you out. She gets all this beep, 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 beep. Then you pay for it. And then what happens? She says, take your stuff. And at first I was like, huh, what? She's like, go ahead, take your stuff. I'm like, but, but I don't have a bag. And she goes, well, take your stuff. I'm like, I see a line behind me. I'm like, okay, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So like, I, I got all my stuff, and my eggs, and my milk, my cheese, my biscuits, everything, and I've got it, and I'm like trying to walk down the aisles, and I'm trying to go out to my car, and stuff's falling all over the place. The milk falls out. The green beans go rolling down the, the parking lot at Walmart. Like, it's a hot mess all over the place. In that moment, how important is that bag? Pretty stinking important. Yes. All of a sudden, something that really on the mainland, a little plastic bag I had never even put any value into, in that moment in the Walmart parking lot where I've got stuff going everywhere, I'm having a whole new appreciation for the bags. In no, there you go. <laughs> and I realized that both are important. The product is important. My eggs, my cheese, my milk, my chips, those are important. But the bag, the vessel, the container is important too. And we need both. God needs both. Okay, I thought I would give another illustration here for you guys. I thought, all right, how do I best communicate to them? I need to really speak their language. So I decided to order a pizza and have it delivered here to the anchor house. Hey, somebody order a pizza! <laughs> oh! Oh! Hey! Oh, watch the rug. 
pizza. <laughs> Somebody order a pizza? Um, uh, pizza? No, uh, um, no, 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 um, pizza? um, um, pizza? Oh, um, <laughs> no, mm, oh dear. Yeah, 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 here you go. Uh, okay, uh, okay, uh, um, uh, okay, if, if this right here, oh, wow, it's hot too. Yeah. Yeah. Hot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. If, if this showed up, at your house on a <laughs> if, if this showed up at your house on family pizza night on Friday night, what question would you ask? Where's the box? You just ordered a pizza, not a box. Go ahead, pass out your pizza. in America. I truly do. I do. But see, God's not going to pour out revival. He's not going to pour out the miracles if he doesn't have clean, empty, available vessels to pour it into. Because if he just poured it all out, kind of like your pizza, it goes to waste. It goes to waste and it makes a mess and everybody laughs and nobody gets it and everybody's like, gross. Well, except for you guys who ate it. <laughs> but do you see the point? The vessel is as important as the, contain as the product. So I decided, all right, I'm going to go and I'm going to ask, how much does the pizza box cost? 35 cents for a pizza box. That's it. But in the moment of that pizza being delivered at your house on a Friday night, how important is that box to you? Especially if that guy's the delivery guy. <laughs> right? It's pretty stinking important. But the product needs a clean, empty, available vessel. Clean, empty, and available. Let's say that a mama has a new baby and the baby starts to cry. And the mama knows it's time to feed the baby. So the mama goes over and she's looking around for a bottle that's got some milk left over it from a couple weeks ago. This is a good idea? No. And then she's just going to pour some new milk into it. It's going to be fine. And then she gives it to the baby. What's going to happen? It's going to make a mess. <laughs> <laughs> in a lot of ways. So what does the mama do? Mom hears baby cry. She goes and she looks for a clean, empty, available vessel. Maybe she cleans the bottle out, sanitizes it, puts the new milk into it, screws on the lid, and then gives it to the baby. He's looking for vessels. Clean, empty, and available. And I get people that say to me all the time, well, Jen, I've never been to seminary. Jen, I haven't read the Bible all the way through. Jen, I haven't, I haven't studied on anybody. I don't have a mentor yet. Jen, I didn't grow up in the church. Are you willing to be a 35-cent box? Because if you're willing to be a 35-cent clean, 
empty, available box, guess what? God will use you. He will use you to pour out his miracles. Everybody give him a hand. You are great, kids of God. <laughs> 2,000 years ago, <clears throat> God realized that we had a mess. This world had a hot mess on its hands called sin. And so he began to look for a vessel, a clean, empty, available vessel. And he found a young Jewish girl named Mary. He had searched for 42 generations. And then he found Mary. And he said, Mary, I know you might not think that you're much. I know you might just think that you're this, this little girl, but you're a clean, empty, available vessel, Mary. Can I use your body? And what did she say? Her yes became God's address. And she put, he put into her salvation for the world, the greatest miracle that has ever taken place. And out of that clean, empty, available vessel came Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man. And Jesus was here on this earth for 33 years. Satan had his eye on Jesus, waiting for his moment. Because he saw the miracles. And he thought, if I can just get a hold of that vessel. And then one day, Satan got a hold of the vessel. He put nails in that vessel. He whipped that vessel. That vessel bled. He put that vessel up on a cross. He spat at that vessel. And then he heard that vessel say, It is finished. And in that moment, hell threw a party. Because hell thought they had won. I mean, after all, the vessel is gone, right? The vessel is dead. They watched the vessel get taken down from the cross and put in to the borrowed tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. They watched that vessel get put away. But then three days later, what happened to that vessel? Rose. That vessel rose from the grave. And Satan, he said, it is finished. He didn't say, I am finished. And that vessel rose. I want you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. First Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, who you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Let's read it again. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Guys, what you do with your body matters. What you do with your body matters. How many of you remember the little children's song, Oh, be careful little eyes what you see. Oh, be careful little ears what you hear. Do you remember from little Sunday school class? Because what goes into your eyes matters. What goes into your ears matters. 
Because just as God won't pour out the miracles, the anointing, the revival into a world that's got no clean, empty, available vessels, because that would make a mess, he's also not going to pour it into dirty baby bottles. Because that too would make a disastrous mess. If we take an empty or a baby bottle that's got old, two-week-old milk in it, and then we just put clean milk in it and give it to the baby, the baby's going to have projectile vomiting and diarrhea. That's gross. Nobody wants that. That's going to make a mess over a bunch of people. He's not going to pour the anointings, the blessings, the miracles into you if you don't have a clean, empty, available vessel. What you do with your body matters. And like I said, I'm looking for just one. Because if one person can get this, it will change the world. That's how valuable a clean, empty, available vessel is. Now, I want you to notice something. In Luke chapter 23, it says that the body of Jesus was taken down off of the cross, and it was put into the borrowed tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Now, I like to say that Jesus was a really good businessman, and he thought to himself, now, why in the world would I buy a tomb when I'm only going to use it for three days? I'm just going to borrow it. Smart. But now let's go back to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 through 20. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, who, have you who you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Jesus knew he wasn't going to need that tomb for more than three days. So he borrowed the tomb, but he bought you. You were bought with a price, a very expensive price, the price of the cross, which gives us hope. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives within me. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The old has passed away. All things have been made new. You determine the magnitude of your miracle. Without God, we're not much. You're right. We're nothing but maybe a 35 cent box at the most. But the product doesn't have the value if it doesn't have a vessel. That's how important you are. I want you to grab your journals. With your black pen, question is, Father, God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, Papa Bear, whatever you call him, comma, what do you want to tell me right now? <coughs> About the value of my vessel. For you. Father, what do you want to tell me right now about the value of my vessel for you? Calm your mind. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Listen. Put your red pen to the paper. Write your name. And then just keep writing. Father, what do you want to tell me right now 
about the value of my vessel for you.
dialogue with him. If he responded to you, write something back. Ask him another question. Don't let it stop with just you asking a question and him giving you a response. Turn it into a dialogue. See what he says next. You can ask another question. You can just thank him for it. Maybe you can just ask him, what else do you want to tell me about this? Is there anything more that you'd like to tell me about being a vessel for you? Remember, he inhabits the praises of his people. So if there seems to be a bit of a roadblock or you're not able to hear or you just think, hmm, is there anything else but you're not hearing anything, go ahead and just praise him. Thank him for something. Show gratitude. Watch his presence show back up. Then go ahead and draw your picture.
in the flesh, we aren't much. But with God, we're world changers. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. See how we've come full circle from day one. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Remember the pregnant woman we talked about? When she walks in the room, everybody knows she's carrying something. There's no doubt that that woman is carrying something. You as a vessel can carry something. You as a vessel can be a world changer. But you determine the magnitude of your marriage. Okay, who's going to share their journal entry first? Father, what do you want to tell me right now about the value of my vessel for you? Go for it. Father, what do you want to tell me right now about the value of my vessel for you? Friend, don't stop. Don't quit the path that you are on. Don't sin against me or your body. When you call my name in times of temptation, I will be there to protect you. I will be waiting like always. Mm. And then I said, I'm not ready. What can I do to be ready? What can I do to ready my heart? He said, be still and be patient. I will show you the way. Pick up your cross and follow me. Submit to me every morning, not some, but every morning. Mm -hmm. Trent, you are ready. You just have to have faith in me. I said, why me? Why do I deserve your love? I don't deserve your mercy or your power. And he said, you're my son. Line up with scripture. Line up with the character of what a good loving father would say. Yeah. And the picture I drew was just like a messy... And do we remember the story about Peter? Peter was willing to get out of the boat. Peter failed. And I don't know if any other of your speakers will tell you this, but I'm going to tell you, you will fail because you're human. There will be moments in your life and in your ministry where you will fail. I don't speak it over you. I'm just saying that in this world you will have trials and tribulations. But take heart, Jesus said, I've overcome the world. And what did Peter do in the moment of his failure? Lord, save me! If you're willing to do it as quick as Peter did, you don't have to stay underwater. I watch too many ministers, missionaries, pastors, people in youth ministry, I watch too many of them fail full time because they stayed under the water. Where if they just would have reached out, Lord, save me, what would Jesus have done? Immediately, Scripture says, Jesus reached out his hand, picked up Peter. And then what happened? They got to experience the miracle again because they walked back to the boat. How cool is that? That even after a failure, because he was willing, Jesus gave him another chance and gave him another miracle. Who's next? Go for it. Um, so I asked uh, the first question and God responded, and then asked another question and asked the one and then the other one. Sure. He said, uh, Father, how do I refine my dirty vessel? How do I step outside the box then? And he said, Another trial holds another gold and another fast, and another gold 
Very cool. Line up with scripture. Line up with the character of what a good, loving father would say. Awesome. Yeah, great illustration. Thank you, Lord. All right, who's next? Go for it. Line up with scripture. Line up the character of what a good loving father would say. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing. Very encouraging. <laughs> Who else? Go ahead. By the way, this side, you guys are going to have to pick it up in a minute because they are doing all the talking. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Go ahead. Uh, father, what do you want to tell me? Line up with scripture. Line up with the character of what a good loving father would say. What picture did you draw? Uh, I drew people running a race. Uh -huh. and I was in the crowds. Awesome. So good. Thanks. Anybody else from this side? No, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Go for it. Um, father, what do you want to tell me right now about the value of my vessel to you? Alexis, what you do with your body is important to me. You could use it for worldly desires, but that is not my desire for you. My desire for you is to use your whole body for me. Your body I designed through the calling I have for you. No one can do exactly what you can, and you are wholly surrendered to me. Trust me with all of your strengths and weaknesses, and most of all, be available for whenever I have need of you. And I said, yes, Father, I know I won't do this perfectly, but help me to become better and better at making myself available to you. Thank you that you want to use me to further your kingdom. And I asked Father, what shape is my vessel? And he said, Alexis, your shape is unique for what I want you to do. Very cool. And I just drew a picture of me. That's nice. <laughs> cool. Self-portrait. I like it. Line up with scripture. Line up with the character of what a good loving father would say. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. What I love most about this journaling practice and the two different color pens is that when I'm having a rough day, I open up my journal and I just read all the red. It changes my perspective real fast. Because then I remember how valuable I am as a daughter and as a vessel to him. Let's pray. Father, I just want to ask for protection for protection over the seeds that have been planted this week. I thank you so much for the abundance that you have planted in each of us, even in me this week. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you'll protect the seeds so that you may reap a harvest, a harvest that will multiply to reach the nations for you. We love you. Mm. In your precious name we pray, Jesus. And all God's people said. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. It's been an awesome week with you. Thank you.